During the fateful year of 105 AC, Sir Criston Cole was appointed the King's Guard to fill the place created by the death of the legendary Sir Ryan Redwine. Sir Criston was a comely young knight of 23. He first came to the attention of the court when he won the melee held at Maidenpool in the honour of King Viserys' ascension. In the final moments of the fight, Sir Criston knocked Dark Sister from Prince Damon's hand with his morning star to the delight of his grace and the fury of the prince. Afterwards, he gave the seven-year-old Princess Rhaenyra the victor's laurel and begged for her favour to wear in the joust. In the lists, he defeated Prince Damon once again and unhorsed both the celebrated Cogley twins of the Kingsguard before falling to Lord Lyman Malister. With his pale green eyes, coal black hair and easy charm, Cole soon became a favourite of all the ladies at court, not the least amongst them, Rhaenyra Targaryen herself. So smitten was she by the charm of the man she called my white knight, that Rhaenyra begged her father to name Sir Criston her own personal shield and protector. The king indulged her in this, as in so much else. Thereafter, Sir Criston always wore her favour in the lists and became a fixture at her side during feasts. Not long after Sir Criston donned his white cloak, King Viserys invited Lionel Strong, Lord of Harrenhal, to join the small council as Master of Law, a big man, burly and balding, Lord Strong enjoyed a formidable reputation as a battler. Those who did not know him often took him for a brute, mistaking his silence and slowness of speech for stupidity. This was far from the truth, however. Lord Lionel had studied at the Citadel in his youth, earning six links of his chain before deciding that a maester's life was not for him. He was literate and learned, his knowledge of the law of the Seven Kingdoms exhaustive. Thrice wed and thrice widowed, the Lord of Harrenhal brought two maiden daughters and two sons to court with him. The girls became handmaidens to Princess Rhaenyra, while the elder brother, Sir Harwin Strong, called Breakbones, was made a captain in the Gold Cloaks. The younger boy, Laris the Clubfoot, joined the King's Confessors. Thus did matters stand in the King's Landing late in 105 AC, and Queen Emma, was brought to bed in Magor's Holdfast and died whilst giving birth to the son that Viserys Targaryen had desired for so long. The boy, named Balon after the king's father, survived her only by a day, leaving the king and court bereft, save perhaps from Prince Daemon, who was observed in a brothel on the street of Silk making drunken jokes with his high-born cronies about the heir for a day. When word of this got back to King Viserys, he became livid. His grace had finally had enough of his ungrateful brother and his ambitions. Once his mourning for his wife and son had run its course, the king moved swiftly to resolve the long-simmering issue of the succession. Disregarding the precedent set by King Jaehaerys in 92 AC and the Great Council in 101 AC, Viserys declared his daughter Rhaenyra to be his rightful heir and named her Princess of Dragonstone. In a lavish ceremony at King's Landing, Hundreds of lords gathered as Rhaenyra sat at her father's feet at the base of the Iron Throne, swearing to honour and defend her right of succession. Prince Daemond was not amongst them. Furious at the king's decree, the prince quit King's Landing, resigning from the city watch. He went first to Dragonstone, taking his paramour, Marissa, with him. Upon the back of his dragon, Craxis, the lean red beast the small folk called the Bloodworm. There he remained for half a year, during which time he got Marissa with child. When he learned she was pregnant, Prince Damon presented her with dragon eggs. But in this, Damon once again went too far and woke his brother's wrath. King Viserys commanded him to return the dragon eggs, send his whore away, and return to his lawful wife, or else be attained as a traitor. The prince obeyed, though with ill grace, dispatching Marissa, eggless, back to Lys, while he himself flew to Runestone in the Vale and to the unwelcome company of his wife. But Marissa lost her child during a storm on the narrow sea. When word reached Prince Damon, he spoke no syllable of grief, but his heart hardened against the king, his brother. Thereafter, he spoke of the king Viserys only with disdain and began to brood day and night on the succession. Though Princess Rhaenyra had been proclaimed her father's successor, there were many in the realm, at court and beyond it, who still hoped that Viserys might father a male heir, for the young king was not yet 30. Grand Maester Runcester was the first to urge Viserys to remarry, even suggesting a suitable choice, the Lady Lena Velaryon, who had just turned 12. A fiery young maiden, freshly flowered, Lady Lena had inherited the beauty of a true Targaryen from her mother, Princess Rhaenys, the daughter of his uncle, Aemon. She also possessed a bold and adventurous spirit from her father, Corlys Velaryon the Sea Snake. As Lord Corlys loved to sell, Lena loved to fly and acclaimed for her own no less of a mount than the mighty Vagar, the oldest and largest of the Targaryen dragons 
since the passing of the Black Dread in 94 AC. By taking the girl to wife, King could heal the rift that had grown between the Iron Throne and Driftmark, and Lena would surely make a splendid queen. But Viserys I Targaryen was not the strongest wield of kings, it must be said. Always amenable and anxious to please, he relied greatly on the counsel of the men around him, and he did as they bade more often than not. In this instance, however, his grace had his own notion, and no amount of argument would sway him from his course. Yes, he would marry again, but not a 12 year old girl, and not for reasons of state. Another woman had caught his eye. He announced his intention to wed Lady Alicent of House Hightower, the clever and lovely 18 year old daughter of the hand, the girl who had read to King Jaehaerys as he lay dying. The Hightowers of Old Town were an ancient and noble family of impeccable lineage. There could be no possible objection to the king's choice of bride, even so, there were those who murmured that the Hand had risen above himself that he had brought his daughter to court with this exact notion in mind. A few even cast doubt on Lady Alison's virtue, suggesting she had welcomed King Viserys into her bed even before Queen Emma's death. These claims were never proven and had very little evidence, though Mushroom repeats them in his testimony and goes far as to claim that the reading was not the only service Lady Alison performed for the old king in his bedchamber as he lay dying. In the Vale of Arran, Prince Damon reportedly whipped the serving man who brought the news to him within an inch of his life. Nor was the sea snake pleased when word reached Driftmark. House Valorian had once again been passed over. His daughter, Lena, scorned, just as his son, Lenor had been by the Great Council and his wife by the Old King back in 92 AC. Only Lady Lena herself seemed untroubled. Her ladyship shows far more interest in flying than in boys, the Maester at Hightower wrote to the Citadel. When King Viserys took Alicent Hightower to wife in 106 AC, House Valarian was notable for his absence. Princess Rhaenyra poured for her stepmother at the feast, and Queen Alicent kissed her and named her daughter. The princess was among the women who disrobed the king and delivered him to the bedchamber of his bride. Laughter and love ruled the Red Keep that night. Whilst across Blackwater Bay, Lord Corliss, the Stinny Snake, welcomed the king's brother, Prince Damon, to a war council. The prince had suffered all he could stand at the Vale of Arran, Runestone, and his wife. Dark Sister was made for a nobler task than slaughtering sheep. He was reported to have told the Lord of the Tides. She has a thirst for blood, but it was not rebellion that the prince had in mind. He saw another path to power, a way to carve out his own petty kingdom to spite his brother, and the Corlys Valarian was more than happy to assist Daemon Targaryen in this, and the Sea Snake and the Rogue Prince set sail together with their eyes firmly set on the Stepstones. The Stepstones, the chain of rocky islands between Dawn and the disputed lands of Essos, had long been the haunt of outlaws, exiles, wreckers, and pirates. Of themselves, the isles were little of worth, but Placed as they were, they can control the sea lanes to and from the narrow sea, and merchant ships passing through those waters were often preyed upon by the inhabitants. Still, for centuries such deparations have remained no more than a nuisance. Ten years earlier, however, the three cities of Lys, Mir, and Tyrosh had put aside their ancient enmities to make common cause in the war against Volantis. After defeating the Volantines in the Battle of the Borderland, the three victorious cities entered into an internal alliance and formed a strong new power, the Triarchy, better known in Westeros as the Kingdom of the Three Daughters, as each of the three cities considered itself a daughter of Valyria. This so-called kingdom was without a true king, being governed by a council of 33 magisters. Once Volantis sued for peace, and withdrew from the disputed lands, and the three daughters had turned their gaze westward, sweeping over the stepstones with their combined armies and fleets under the command of Mirish Prince Admiral, who had earned the title of Pragas Crab Beater when he staked out hundreds of the captured pirates on the wet sands to drown beneath the rising tides, and it was now the turn of Daemon Targaryen and Corlys Valarian to stake their claim to these lands.